as any one of these subjects we could have uh, we could have spent the entire three months on and uh, so I really had to just go very rapidly and we're getting down here to the next the last session and uh, be reviewing next week before we start into the uh, fall of uh, the New Testament and so we will be doing the New Testament beginning in September the chronology of the New Testament of course to do that we'll have to review the Old Testament for at least one Sunday and we'll we'll have to go through the intertestamental period for a Sunday and it'll be about the third week before we actually get into the actual New, New Testament itself. Well it'll be quite a while before we get the New Testament because Matthew, Mark, Luke and John you know are not in the New Testament that's where we put them but they're really not because uh, the church didn't start until Acts and uh, so everybody's wrong by putting the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in the New Testament but we're not going to come to conflict with them about that but really they, they do fall as like Old Testament after the intertestamental period but it's the start of the New Covenant and we'll talk about that well you know each week I bring an article big one this time and uh, like I say I don't put any confidence in newspaper articles but the thing is, they, they pick up on it. This is New York Times News Service article picked up by our Lexington paper. And this one says, time is evolving. Time is evolving. Well, that's so controversial that even the, um, the astrophysicists and cosmologists and all these people that study this kind of thing, they're, they're really casting a lot of doubt on this thing. And uh, there's some very interesting comments in this article, though. And it says, an international team of astrophysicists has discovered the basic laws of nature as understood today might be changing. Well, if it is, then it says this will rewrite the physics textbooks. You see, they really need to rewrite the physics textbooks to be able to get evolution. Because the physics textbook has the first law of thermodynamics and second law of thermodynamics and the Boyle's gas laws and Henry's laws and, and law of gases diffusion and Dalton's laws and Newton's laws of motions and things of motion, things like that. And we find uh, there's a lot of violation. Uh, just as Ray was talking about this scientist from Sandia Laboratories out of Albuquerque. Uh, that's one of our uh, nuclear laboratories out there. And they're talking about uh, they have proof of the, the sodium build up in the ocean. Well that may, like Ray said, not sound very interesting, but the nickel content of the ocean and the helium content of the atmosphere, all of these things give evidence of a very young earth, no older than 10,000 years. And so that's the reason why they're important. It's not important to understand them uh, as a nuclear physicist or astrophysicist or a uh, chemical biologist or anything like that. But what's important to, to know is to understand enough about it to be well read enough on it that when you come across something you can recognize it as fraud or as an imagination or as uh, the truth. And like this article here has a lot of imagination in it. it. Uses the word might, could be, and uh, things like that. It says researchers use the world's largest single telescope. See, the researchers, that's a magic word. That means, hey, you know, they're smart guys. They use the world's largest telescope, single telescope, which means they had the best of equipment, and they studied the behavior of metallic atoms. Now, you know how small an atom is? Atom's a pretty small thing. They studied the behavior of metallic atoms in, glass, in gas clouds as far from Earth as 12 billion light years. See, now we're starting to use this 12 to 15 billion like it's old hat now, remember? When we started uh, this course, you know, mainly it was three and a half to five billion years, but just in the last few months now, all the articles now are starting to pick up on this 12 to 15 billion years that the Hubble telescope is supposed to have discovered. And uh, by looking farther and farther out into space, they still haven't found the edge of the universe yet, so they know when it started. So now they know it started at least 12 to 15 billion years ago. And we also talked about the article of the people who were looking and studying the shadow from, the, from that when it happened 12 to 15 billion years ago. It left a shadow and they're studying that shadow. Not only are they studying shadows, but now with the world's largest single telescope, uh, they're looking at metallic atoms in gas clouds 12 billion light years away. You know how far 12 billion light years is? 
that if you're traveling 186,000 miles per second, per second, 186,000 miles per second, it'll take you 12 billion years to get there. You know how big a number 12 billion years is? Write that down sometime, put all the zeros on it. And they're looking out there with a telescope and they're studying atoms out there. That's amazing. And it says, uh, but the team could not explain without assuming a change in a basic constant of nature. In other words, they're seeing something they can't explain. So they said, well, the only way to explain this is to violate the laws of nature. And they have no qualms about that. Uh, if it uh, confirmed, the findings could mean that other constants regarded as immutable, in other words, they, they were not going to change, like the speed of light, have changed over the history of the cosmos. I find that amazing. Here, evolution is uh, a, a theory of uniformitarianism. The only way you can measure the past is by the rate something's happening in the present. And they deny that they believe that, but they use it all the time. And now this team's coming along and saying it could be that there has been changes over the history of this. We call it the cre creation. We don't call it the cosmos. And then they give the name of the lead researcher in the school he's from. And uh, says, ah, his information, watch this, this is always in the articles, is to be published August 27th in the field's most prestigious journal, Physical Review Letters. You see, here we got a very smart man again with his very brilliant equipment. And he's speculating about what they're seeing out in the universe, these billions of light years away. And it has been accepted by the editors already of this very prestigious scientific journal. And it would be written up for all of his peers to read. And see, this is the way that this thing gets uh, circulated and educated and brought down. It will be taught in the graduate level schools. Then it will come down to university. And then it will come down to the colleges. And it will come down to the high schools. And next thing you know, we'll be teaching it in uh, cartoons. You'd be surprised how much evolution's in the cartoons. Well, here's one of them that amazes me. Uh, said, uh, particularly the prediction that previously unknown dimensions might exist in fabric of space. In other words, they're now starting to toy with the idea that maybe there's some other dimensions other than one we live in. Well, I think our Bible told us that many, many uh, thousand, several thousand or so, a hundred years ago, or several hundred years ago, we talk about Paul and the different uh, levels of heaven and being lifted up. And there are other dimensions. And we have the dimensions that Satan and the demons operate in. And we have the dimension here that us physical human beings are in. And uh, we don't believe in ghosts like Casper the ghost and things like that. But there are demons out there. Satan is out there. And there is a dimension out there. There's, a, there's different levels of heaven. And so they're now speculating that there might be unknown dimensions in the fabric of space. And then here another guy, and they list to him and his credentials, says it's possible that there is time evolution of the laws of physics. In other words, the laws of physics just may not be exact. They may have been evolving over time. So the law of physics today that uh, you only have so much mass and so much energy and you can't create nor destroy mass and energy, maybe that's, maybe that's evolved to that today, but back in the past maybe that was not true. So you see, this is the start, if this is accepted, this is the start of trying to erode the very basic fabrics of the uh, laws of physics. And they give another man's name here, and he's an astrophysicist at another big fancy laboratory. And uh, he says these findings uh, could uh, force revisions in cosmology. And it says it might give credence to an unproven theory called the string theory, which uh, is theory that extra dimensions exist. So they already have a, they call it the string theory. And uh, so the implications is this would be, uh, this would be very serious and this would upset the apple cart. In other words, it would upset the whole scientific apple cart if they found out other dimensions actually existed. But do you think for one minute they're going to uh, admit that this dimension is the dimension of, that God inhabits, it's a dimension of eternity, and all these, the things that we know from our, our Christian uh, literature and from what God has disclosed about himself to us in the Bible? No, they'll not, uh, they'll not believe it that way. Just like they believe that, uh, you know, the world's been submerged by water, all the earth has been submerged by water, but not at the same time. In other words, see, they will change it in such a way 
that it will not uh, validate any of the story from the scripture. And they give a couple other guys' names. And one here, he won the Nobel Prize in Physics. He said, the importance of such a discovery would rank 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. So you see, they've got all these people now falling in line. But there are some that are not falling in line because there are some astrophysicists and all that do not believe in evolution. And uh, in fact, uh, they say by studying the heavens and the stars and all, it could not have just happened with a Big Bang or anything like that. And uh, it says uh, that uh, what they're studying, uh, this guy here, an astrophysicist, and he's at Princeton, uh, these are such tiny changes that it may be uh, just era in their data. And of course they said, no, no, we, we were very careful in our research and we don't have any era in it and all that. And uh, so a couple of these other astrophysicists said, uh, we, we think we will wait for further evidence because they're looking at a very minute thing. In fact, it's, uh, they gave a figure in here somewhere of what they were looking for, what they're looking at. Uh, it said uh, the magnitude of the change apparently observed by the group is minute. One part in 100,000 in a number called the fine structural constant over 12 billion years, referred to as alpha. And alpha refers to uh, the speed of light and the, the laws of physics that are immutable. But now they're saying maybe they're not immutable. It just so happened, I happened to look down here on the same page. This is Thursday's paper. Planets found orbiting stars similar to the sun. So this opens up the possibility that smaller Earth-like planets might populate the stars' inner orbits. And uh, it, it said, uh, and then we'll go to Mars. Mars holds plenty of surprises. It's been the most probed, photographed, and examined of all the planets except Earth. The latest information revealed a system of ancient valleys. Now get this, some 100 miles wide. How wide is Grand Canyon? Five miles. Mars got canyons 100 miles wide, partly buried beneath lava, ash, and dust. The valleys were formed. Uh, scientists from the University of Arizona and Jet Propulsion Lab, you've heard of these places before. Uh, they use laser altimeter data from the Mars Global Surveyors and that's how the valleys were found. Now listen to this one. The best explanation for these valleys is that they are outflow channels for major floods that may have occurred at times in Martian history. Mars is now cold and desert-like, but many planetary scientists think that large oceans may have existed in times when it was warmer and wetter. In other words, it's okay to have gigantic global floods on Mars, but it's not okay to have gigantic global flood on Earth. And on Mars, they made canyons 100 miles wide. Grand Canyon's only five miles wide. And that's from the widest points, mile deep, you know, and we've talked about the Grand Canyon already. Well, we've been talking about two religions, creationism and evolutionism, and that's exactly what they are. And uh, we, uh, it takes faith to believe both of them. Saw a letter in the letters to the editor yesterday or something or the day before, and someone from Laurel County here had written in and said that uh, uh, about evolution creationism and said the definition of evolution was not that you get something from nothing, that you had to start with something. So you had to start with something and then evolve it. And then it went on to say, uh, so uh, you had to have something to be able to evolve it, and that's evolution. He said then. To have something, you had to get it somewhere. It can't just exist eternally in the past. And uh, so therefore, you had to get something from nothing. And that was a definition of creationism and God. So they were, their, their letter was saying, the only way you can get evolution is to base it on creationism. You had to have a God to create it. Even if there is evolution, you'd have to have a God to create it in the first place for it to even evolve. And they were not saying they believed in evolution. They were just pointing out that the evolutionists have to start with something. And, uh, but anyway, it's a religion, it takes faith, there's no way to prove it. It's, uh, it's uh, two opinions about the Earth's age and uh, difference of a uh, few thousand years up to 10,000 years as versus now 12 to 15 billion. The uh, creationist opinion has never changed, but over this, the course of my studies in science over the last 50, 55 years or so, 
uh, it has changed from a few hundred thousand years to 12 to 15 billion years in the evolutionary area. It's two philosophies because one philosophy is that we have a creator, we have a responsibility, we, we have a moral code, and we're all that type of thing. And the other philosophy is that we are self-actuated and we're evolved and we're just the smarter, maybe the smartest of all animals, and that we're continuing to evolve and we really have no future. A global flood, a myth or truth, we certainly have uh, pointed out an awful lot of evidence for the truth of the global flood. And even in written accounts, uh, there's, uh, there's an eyewitness account in the Bible. Of course, you have to believe the Bible there, and that goes back to your uh, religion and your opinion about the earth's age and what is your philosophy. But uh, there's, uh, th there's no real evidence that this global flood is a myth because uh, the biblical story was not based upon the Babylonian flood epic. They've got it backwards. The Babylonian flood epic was based upon the flood of the Bible. Dinosaurs and man, they coexisted. Also, we showed the picture of the Japanese fishing boat that caught the seagoing dinosaur. We know that it's written in history by Marco Polo, by Alexander the Great, about uh, witnessing dinosaurs and their adventures in Afghanistan, India, and China. And also, there's pictures drawn by American native peoples on the walls of canyons and uh, in caves of dinosaurs. And they'd had to see them to be able to draw them. Of course, how, they would have, but how else would they have known what they looked like? The Ice Age, ancient or recent, the evidence points to recent. You can't get an Ice Age with a primordial boiling ocean and a, a cool down and uh, that type of thing. And the Ice Age is supposed to occur this glacierization and all supposed to occur in several cycles and several times. You'd have to have lots of warm water and a cool earth. The only way you can get that is to have a lot of dust and volcanic ash in the atmosphere to block out the sun's rays while rupturing the, uh, the land mass and all this volcanic dust coming out blocking the sun and also the water coming out from underneath the earth and it being warm. You'd wind up with gigantic amounts of warm water. You'd wind up with a cool earth because of blocking the earth's uh, sun rays and you'd have almost instant forming uh, ice age which happened after the flood of course. And then of course we know that the ocean levels were much lower at that time because we have the old ancient seashore as it's called the continental shelf that's out underneath the ocean around all the continents and if you take the water down to that ancient seashore then all land masses are connected and people could have uh, relocated all over the earth right after the Tower of Babel and so the Tower of Babel at that time there was still lots of ice uh, formed in the northern southern hemispheres people were able to migrate and more and more evidence is coming out about this migration uh, the, uh, we just discussed the last week or so how the water in the Bering Strait between Alaska and Siberia is only about 60 feet deep and you don't have to take the ocean level down very much at all where people could have walked out of what's now known today as East Russia, Siberia, into Alaska. And the migration route is pretty well known now that they came down from Alaska and came right on down into what's now Canada, the United States, Mexico, and all the way to the tip of South America. And those are the peoples that made all those cities up in the mountains and valleys and everything. And evil evolved or sin. Uh, the only way you can get evil in evolution is that uh, it just had to evolve. In other words, uh, did we, were we good and we had to come up with evil? Or when we become human beings rather than being monkeys and apes, uh, did we evolve evil? Did we invent evil? Where does evil come from? What is evil? And uh, evil is sin. It's a violation of God's code. And a lot of things that happen to us today are consequences of evil. Just because something bad happens to us does not mean we personally have sinned. But it could be that this is a consequence of somebody's sin a hundred years ago. Uh, sometimes I look at some of the countries that just undergo horrible natural disasters. I mean monsoon floods which kill 50 to 100,000 people. Earthquakes kill 30, 40, 50,000 people. And I look at those countries and I look to see that for hundreds of years that they have been involved in, in, in some type of very uh, uh, anti-God type uh, religious activity 
uh, you know, Shintoism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, all, the, and the, all these different religions like that, many of them are also being involved with the sacrifice of uh, human beings and things of that nature. Uh, so we talked about that, and we talked about race. That if you believe in evolution, you have to believe in race. And if you believe in race, you have to believe that one race is going to evolve the rest, because Evolution would never evolve three or four equal competing races. So uh, race then, there has to be one of the races that's slightly superior and is going to evolve the rest and the rest are going to vanish. And if you believe in evolution. And of course, uh, just like uh, uh, you know, our government, they, they believe this, but they don't dare publish it anymore because uh, uh, that's too sensitive. It's not being uh, politically correct. But we don't worry about the spotted owl or about the snail darter or about the loggerhead turtle or the bald eagle. that or what for we got but we'll just back up just about half a minute talking about the government will protect loggerhead turtles and and bald eagles and snail darters and the spotted owl and all that kind of thing uh, recognizing that hey it, it needs to help evolution out evolution's not uh, evidently not smart enough to outwit uh, man because man's able to uh, cause some of these things to go into extinction and so uh, so we we have that help being taken. Sometimes I, I look, and this sounds very racial on my part, but you know I'm not a racist, don't even believe in race or anything. But it looks as if the government's taking the same view toward people that, uh, that minority groups need extra help in their evolution because they've not evolved far enough to be able to, 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 uh, to be able to compete against the majority. So the government's stepping in with, uh, with quota systems and extra money and scholarships to try to to make up for the deficiency of evolution. Well, that gets very, very controversial, and we're not headed there because us believers do not believe in race. Us believers believe that there is human beings, that there's no such thing as race, there's no differences between the blacks and the whites and the reds and the yellows. It's just that those are genetic pools that got isolated after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, after the dispersion, and after the ice caps melted and the water came off and cut us off into certain areas and in certain areas favored certain genetic pools and in turn we look at this as being native groups, people groups or races. There's no such thing as race. And uh, so we talked about the National Academy of Sciences. We talked about they had, do have an agenda and their agenda is to sell evolution. Now in all the schools. In fact, they say that our, our children are being deprived of evolutionary information. That's hard for me to believe. Our children are being deprived of an alternate theory. In other words, uh, they're only uh, able to teach one theory, that of evolution, see, and teach it as fact. Well, evolution, vast time, random chance, violates laws, recycling, limited life, no accountability, man is an animal, survival of the fittest. Creation, six days, purpose, design, also violates the laws. And uh, definite beginning, definite ending, eternal life, accountability to God. Man is in the image of God. And we talked about what that means. And we are to love our fellow man. It's not survival of the fittest. It's not killing to see who can get ahead and that type of thing. It's not competition. But that seems to be the way that... This is the second interruption big we had. And during the interruption, while the power was down and everything, we circulated a bunch of fossils around in the room. And we circulated fossils of trilobites and some leaves and ferns and some fish. Uh, petrified even to where you can see their, their rib bones, their spinal column and uh, eye spots. And, you know, you can see the whole thing, which just gives evidence of very sudden, rapid burial. And which brings up this next overhead right here that uh, according to the evolutionary scheme, nothing to something which they cannot explain, but it was chaos and a big bang. And see, my, my overhead's already out of, uh, out of date. When I made this up, it was 4.6 billion years ago. 
when this big bang happened. But now we're saying 12 to 15 billion, so about three to four times as much. And so they went from no life to life, and then eventually worked their way up to what's called the basically a five kingdom system. And uh, the fungi, I don't think I have the fungi on here, I have the, the bacteria, the uh, proteus, and the multicellular plants and multicellular animals. There should be a fungi in here also for a five kingdom system in accordance with evolution. And man, of course, is in this line over here. And so that's, that's basically the, the theory of uh, evolution right there. Now, that evolution had to give rise to a, uh, this DNA here. And uh, this is amazing because DNA is a double strand of phosphates and sugars. These pink bands here just repeating phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, both, both strands. And you see there's only four different groups in here. There's an A, a G, and a T, and uh, a C. And anywhere you look, that's all you have. You just have either G and C across from each other, or you have A and T across from each other. T could be over there and A over here, either way. But T and A are always paired across from each other, and C and G are always. And those stand for four different things, adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. And those four base groups make up all the life we know today. And, uh, you know, somebody says, well, that gives evidence of evolution. Because if, you have, if we have all the same base groups, we must have come from one source. No. What it does gives uh, evidence of a sovereign creator who knew that one day he was going to, you know, allow us to have to eat to live. In other words, we had to have things to nourish and keep our system of dividing the DNA up to get new cells so we could stay alive. We can't eat things that do not have our same base groups because we couldn't get the base groups we need from that. So the reason why a horse or a, or a cow or a chicken or apples and all that have the same base groups is because we all have the same base groups because uh, of the food chain. And it would be impossible for us to eat beef and to live if beef had a completely different set of base groups. So just having the same base groups doesn't mean we evolved from one single source. It simply means, hey, it, that is available uh, for us to be able to be nutritious and to eat. Well, another thing, it's, uh, remember we talked about chlorine and all the atoms are this way with all those positive atoms clustered together in the nucleus of the atom. And we talked about how that uh, there's tremendous energy in here. And if we can just come in here and knock a couple of these things out and uh, they'll knock a couple more out and they'll knock a couple more things out in certain atoms like uh, uranium. Uh, we can get a chain reaction going and release that tremendous amount of heat and it will become a fireball and we know it as a nuclear weapon. And uh, that's what our friend out in the laboratory at Sandia, the one that was charged with losing all the secrets, you know, he was involved in those kind of things. Um, Sandia is one of our prime contractors for that. I, I used to work with Sandia. I had a couple of contracts out there when I was in the Air Force that I was a manager over. Scientific method, observe, propose, experiment, gather data, formulate, repeatable, accepted widely, it becomes a law. Evolution has not gone through that and cannot go through it. Here's the cycle that we're in today. The cycle is that uh, man breathes out CO2, plants take in CO2 to live, makes fruit, and puts out oxygen, which all the other uh, animals of all kinds, including human beings, uh, do this. And this energy comes from the light energy from the sun shining through the leaves. Photosynthesis takes place, and you build up these sugars, and this becomes the food chain right here. So everything here you see is involved in reoccurring cycles, and they're beautifully, beautifully matched. And the problem is, if you try to evolve this, which one evolved first? Did the CO2 evolve first or the oxygen cycle evolve first? You need them both working together. Uh, I saw something recently, I heard it on television, that said there was already a big supply of uh, carbon dioxide available, so the plants found all this carbon dioxide, and they started making all this oxygen, and just in time, because animals were being evolved, and they needed the oxygen. So it all just happened to work out in a very good circumstance. Well, how old is the earth? Like we said before in the course, we're not sure. 
But one thing we do know, it's not millions or billions. And at most, 7,000 to 35,000 years. That's all the helium you can find. That's all the carbon-14 can come up with. It's all that the magnetic field disintegration will tolerate. It's all that the cosmic sphere accumulation on the Earth and on the Moon will tolerate and the sodium in the ocean and nickel content of the ocean and you go on and on. There's one over 100 things like that that gives evidence to a much younger Earth. In other words, uh, then evolution says given enough time though, anything can happen. Well, I have an experiment. Where's my experiment? Here it is. I have a scientific experiment here. And uh, given enough time, anything can happen at least once. Random chance. I have a Pepsi can, I have a sock, I have some paper, some up fell on the floor, I better get it back or I may not get what I want. Some paper, I got some copper pennies in a bag, I got a pencil, I got a clothespin, some wood, there's some glass fragments in there, there's a rubber band in there, and I have all these particular parts, make sure you get that copper back in there and every scrap of paper we needed. And what I'm going to do, see, I shake this up long enough. By random chance, I should get myself a 21 jewel watch. <laughs> I've been doing this for probably 20 years. You say, well, give it enough time, anything can happen at least once. You may, may need to do it for a million years. Personally, I believe it's just as impossible over a million or a billion years of shaking that bag, I still think you'll have a can, a piece of paper, and a pencil, and a clothespin, fragments of glass, and some copper pennies in there. I don't think you'll ever get a watch. To get a watch, the old saying says you have to have a watchmaker. And the watchmaker, of course, that made the universe is God. You can't shake this bag and get a watch. You just cannot do it. But I keep hoping. Some guy told me one time, I forget where I was at, I had this bag laying over, and he had, he had heard this before and seen it, and he knew I was going to do it at some time during, during the seminar. So he was going to slip up and put a watch in there. And I said, you'd have lost the watch too. I said, I finally got my watch, and I'd have just pocketed that watch, and uh, I'd have shown him. And, uh, but anyway... Uh, given enough time, anything can happen at least once. That's absolutely impossible. Uniformitarianism, uh, you know, things are happening uh, today or at the same rate they've happened in the past. That's absolutely untrue. We, there's not a thing uniform about uh, what we see observing around us today, like the amount of water flow or the rain or the storms or lava flow or heat or mountain building or valley making or any of those things. It's just not uniform. Index fossils, they were stacked up in order to prove evolution and then looked at and uh, used to prove evolution. The geological column was stacked up in accordance with index fossils. It exists only in textbooks. The geological column it does not exist anywhere on the face of the earth. On the face of the earth, the layers are all jumbled up. Very old layers are sitting on top of what's supposed to be very new layers as determined by evolutionary geologists. And a big bang, four and a half, now to 10 to 15 billion years. And uh, what about dinosaurs? We talked about them. They sell evolution. They sell millions and millions of years. And they sell natural process without a designer. That's the reason dinosaurs are so big today. Yet we have seen that dinosaurs are not something from a long time ago. The Ice Age, ancient Earth, post-flood. It's post-flood. And much of the evidence like the Ice Man and things like that were, um, were pointing to the fact. The filling of the Mediterranean Sea Basin, the filling of the Black Sea, all these things give evidence to a worldwide catastrophe and the after effects of that catastrophe when the Ice Age, when the ice caps melted, and it filled up the Mediterranean, and then it overflowed the Dardanelles and filled up the Black Sea. And all that points to uh, a worldwide flood with after consequences. Bad things, death, disease, and suffering have come from man's sin and the consequences of sin. Different races, biblical, all humans from the very first. We're all humans. Secular, we evolved separately over many thousands of years. Therefore, we must be going to continue 
to uh, keep on evolving. National Academy of Sciences, teaching about evolution and the nature of science is a major pamphlet they put out and put in the hands of all the science, natural science and biology teachers and asking them to teach not the theory of evolution, but the facts of evolution that our children are being deprived. We talked about Mount St. Helens and how when it blew up in 1980, it was the best observed geological event in history and the best documented. And how out there we found ancient uh, uh, seashores made in the last 20 years, ancient canyons made in the last 20 years, ancient um, badlands like in South Dakota uh, formed in the last 20 years, the formation, the first stages of coal in the last 20 years, uh, the um, several others there, I think I'm leaving out, but uh, oh yes, the polystratified uh, fossilization of trees and things of that nature. And all the, and a cliff, 600 foot cliff that was there two years later that was not there before. Now how long does it take to make a 600 foot cliff? Well, in this case it only took two years. And uh, so you can see things. How can we say things are uniform today if we don't know about events in the Earth's history such as Mount St. Helens? We've had many, many volcanic eruptions out in Arizona and New Mexico. You could drive for miles, I mean for an hour or two, beside great gigantic lava flow, lava tubes. And these tubes are formed when lava is flowing uh, underneath water. In other words, the evidence is that we had this gigantic amount of water over Arizona and New Mexico and uh, all this lava was coming up under the water and it makes these lava tubes. Gigantic things, look almost like mountains. And if evolution is true, last week we said that there's no creator God, we're not in the image of God, man is just another animal, earth begun in chaos, there's no special day, there's no absolute moral code. And if evolution is true and you believe in a God, then God is a liar because God did not say he used evolution. He said he divinely spoke it into existence and we can't come up with theistic evolution because God didn't do it that way. Well, what's the end? Of course, you're secular. Our sun will dim. All life forms will cease. And that's it. In other words, we're not special. Uh, we have no future. Uh, if I felt that way, I don't know what I would do. I mean, goodness gracious, if I thought I was only going to be here for one little old life cycle, and I see these other people have a lot more here on earth than I have, what's wrong with me taking it away from them if I can get away with it? Because there's really no moral code. It's survival of the fittest. I mean, how can you have a moral code if you don't have a creator? It's just a, an ethical thing of self-actualization. You just you decide you want to be what we call moral. It seems that's what we're trying to do in this country anyway. We put God out of it and we'll just decide what is right. And we'll do what we think is right. And I think the Bible has something to say about that, that man started doing what was right in their own eyes. I think you'll find it probably in uh, probably Samuel or somewhere at the beginning of it. Where is it at? Judges. Is that the last part of Judges before? Yeah. Where? Oh, okay. The, the man began to do what was right in his own eyes, turned away from God. Well, Christian, of course, the day of the Lord will come and heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will heat. That means atoms are going to fall apart, fervent heat, and the earth also. And God's going to come up with a new heaven and earth. I think the other day when I brought this up, I didn't show where or say anything about where we'd be when that earth and heaven and earth was destroyed. But see, there's already an eternity. And the creation exists within eternity. Eternity existed before the creation. God created. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning for the heavens and the earth. Eternity was already existent. God was already existent. All has always been existent. Now, we don't understand that. We don't have the mind to understand that. But the point is that when this new heaven and earth will be made, it's after the other one will pass away. And God will just preserve us. He'll preserve all people, believers and unbelievers. He'll preserve the unbelievers in the special place of the lake of fire and outer darkness. He'll preserve us in that eternity and create a new heaven and earth for us when it's never been contaminated by sin. Remember, we need to get redeemed from the penalty of sin. We need to become sanctified 
from the power of sin over our lives and then we need a glorified body because uh, we need a body that is totally absent of the presence of sin. So that, that's the three things that God has in plan for us. And of course, what's the future? Of course, you started here again. Unknown, something from nothing, all that all the way. Future, death of the star. Over here though, creationism. We were created, known, nothing to something by a known creator. It was very good, organized into kinds. Man fell, God redeemed future harmony, and eternity. We look forward to eternity. We are eternal in this room as we sit here today. Everybody here is an eternal being. There's no one here that's going to be annihilated. And uh, Jehovah Witnesses believe we'll all be annihilated. And there's not a one of us in here going to become a god. And the Mormons believe that. And, and the Catholic Church... They have no surety that they'll be in heaven or not. They really don't know. Most Catholics don't have the slightest idea if they really will be in heaven or not. Whereas a true believer knows that we'll be in heaven. A Catholic can never be sure. Now there's Christians in the Catholic Church, don't get me wrong. But they can't be sure of their salvation because of the theology of the church. And the Mormons, they really look forward to eternity because they're going to have all their heavenly wives and celestial children and have their own earth to rule and over and to send these little celestial spirits down to occupy new babies that are being born in their own little creation they become God and you know Satan and, and Jesus were brothers and they were in competition as to who would offer the best plan of salvation for the earth and they presented their plans to the supreme God and the Supreme God chose Jesus' plan. And so that's the reason why we're under this plan of Jesus. And Satan is the loser, and he's a sore loser, so he's trying to mess it all up. Now, that's Mormon theology. Now, I'm not kidding. And uh, there's a lot more there than just that. And the Jehovah Witnesses just believe, man, you had to be in 144,000, or you couldn't go to heaven. Well, they, you know, it shows you the... The uh, original uh, Russell, you know, the ori original instigator of that theology, he never did think the Jehovah Witnesses would get more than 144,000, did he? Because he said 144,000 ought to go to heaven. Well, the cult grew. And they grew bigger than 144,000. So these others who become, uh, you know, Jehovah Witnesses after the 144,000 were already made, they begin to wonder what's going to happen to us. We get annihilated? So they had a little change in their theology that they could stay on earth and live on earth and keep all the possessions they could accumulate here on earth. Works-centered theology. And now they're in trouble again. All the people of the 144,000 that have enough smarts to run a big organization like that have died. And now the remaining 144,000, they don't have anybody capable of running that organization. They're going to have to have a new uh, vision that someone other than 144,000 can ascribe to the leadership. See, the Mormon church is getting involved with this too, with people living longer and longer. The 12 uh, apostles that run the church, and the president can only come from the 12 apostles. These guys are now in their 80s and 90s before they get there. And by the time they get to be the president, they're senile. And so they're having real troubles with that. So you can look for the Jehovah Witness and the Mormons both to have a major change in theology shortly. One to look forward to that's uh, positive is the Worldwide Church of God, Armstrongism, in Pasadena, California. And uh, Takash, the leader of it, is really trying to sway that whole church into becoming Christian. Used to live down the street from Ambassador College when I lived in uh, that area. But anyway, Remove the preconceived evolutionary process. Remove millions and billions of years. Take the Bible seriously. You'll find your answer to what happened and when and how and why and all of that. And you've seen this before right here. It's the way we usually end up is that there's future restoration. And that's when the lambs, wolves, leopards, and children and bears, calves and snakes will dwell together peaceably. We can't imagine that, can we? And uh, imagine letting her children play with a cobra. 
We'd say, no way. If you think about something long enough, it is just bound to have occurred. That's a major philosophical belief in evolution. That's right out of the textbook. But I've taken it and said, hey, that's really a paraphrase of Psalms 119.11. By word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. If you think about it long enough, just bound to occur. In other words, your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. We'll start next week with a review, finish it up, and then after that we'll go to New Testament.